Hello, this is Dean Kernut, and welcome to the Alpha Exchange, where we explore topics in financial markets associated with managing risk, generating return, and the deployment of capital in the alternative investment industry. There are lies, damn lies, and statistics, as the saying goes, and about the latter, Adam Parker knows a thing or two. Armed with a PhD in stats, he began his Wall Street career as a semis analyst at Sanford Bernstein in 1999. Reflecting back on the deep dive research the firm was known for, he notes that today's rapid fire information environment requires especially efficient communication to clients. We look backward to gather some insights on how Adam's framework and process came to be. Markets teach lessons, and for Adam, it is the recovery periods in March of 2009, in March of 2020, for example that illustrated the need to look past headline negativity and embrace risk when it was difficult to do so. He shares as well the challenges inherent in determining if change in margins, in profits, and in stock price, for example, is structural versus cyclical. We shift to Adam's founding of Trivariate Research, a firm providing top-down investment strategy to institutional clients. First, we review some of the chaos that ensued three years back during the pandemic and learn of some of the factor work that isolated the work from home versus reopening theme, a basket further distilled by adding a high and low quality factor to each. Next, we talk about crowding, an area of focus at Trivariate. Here, the team collects data on ownership among a prominent group of stock pickers, aimed at identifying both conviction as well as bad crowding. We round out the conversation by further exploring crowding, but in the context of hidden overlapping factors. Here, Adam talks about his work in the area of signal correlation, and how factor sensitivities of sets of stocks can vary substantially over time. The result is a quote, handle with care approach to interpreting model outputs. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Alpha Exchange, my conversation with Adam Parker. My guest today on the Alpha Exchange is Adam Parker. He's the founder and CEO of Trivariate Research, a firm providing top-down solutions and identifying actionable trade themes as well as working on the risk management part of the portfolio for its clients. Adam, it's great to have you on the podcast today. Thanks so much for having me and happy to be here. Excited to have the conversation. We'll do a little bit of history. We'll spend plenty of time on your founding of the firm that you're running and what's on your mind in these very spicy times. We're taping this on a day when the S&P is down. Powell is testifying, grueling testimony in front of folks like Elizabeth Warren, but the bond market doesn't like it and the stock market doesn't love it either. So let's get our conversation underway. We'll talk a little bit about how you got started in the industry. You've got an impressive resume here with a PhD in, I believe it's statistics, but tell us about the early days for you and how you got your start in the industry of Wall Street. I wish it were some sexy story of lifelong passion, but I don't really think I knew what a stock was until I was 30 years old. So I wasn't a kid listing off the companies in the Dow when I was in grammar school or anything. I did a PhD in statistics. My best friend worked at some firm called Sanford Bernstein. I never heard of it. I interviewed there and I loved it. A bunch of nerdy people who like to analyze stuff and kind of a great place to dig in and research. And in sort of the investigative reporting nerd sort of way, long-term research. So I loved it. And I worked there doing quantitative research, and then I became a fundamental semiconductor analyst. So for me, my formative years, when I still think of myself, it's as a bottom-up analyst picking stocks and then writing what they call Bernstein Black Books, long 100-page things on one stock or a group of stocks. And for me, it was U.S. semiconductors. So that was kind of my formative initial big break on Wall Street. Well, the Bernstein Black Book versus the micro-tweet era that we live in today, these seem like very different... (laughs) environments. And Bernstein's a firm I know a little bit about just by way of its reputation, I think, for excellence in research. And I think you allude to that just via the black books and the depth of really getting inside a story from the ground up. I'd love to just learn a little bit more about the particular brand of research practiced by that firm and maybe what you were able to take away from it. Honestly, it was just long horizon, deep fundamental research. For those of us who were there before Alliance bought Bernstein and before the last 10 years, I think there was a lot of pride in working there, you know, kind of deep dives into companies and the clients that value that kind of research were really longer term investors. But we wrote a lot about capital use, buybacks, dividends, M&A, leverage, 
the thought process that I learned to have as a young person, probably irresponsibly young, was, hey, what would I do if I were the CEO of the company? And then you, there's this 35-year-old kid saying, well, if I were Intel CEO, I would do X, Y, and Z. But it was a really healthy thought process in a way because when you learn to think like a CEO of a company, you learn to say, okay, am I a good steward of capital? How do I get a relatively higher multiple? Like the things that they want to be evaluated on and their boards are talking about all the time. So in a way, it was just it was great training to be around a bunch of just hardworking, passionate, and I would say quirky people was great. I think the DNA of the firm was not to hire people from Wall Street, but to hire industry experts who were either in consulting firms or worked at the companies that they ended up covering. There were a couple of us, me being one of them, who were aberrant. I was an associate doing quantum research, and I just wanted to be an analyst, and that slot opened up, and they let me do it. But I guess I just told them I'm better counting with the chips than I am knowing what they are. But the brand, the DNA of the firm was more like industry, deep dive, industry knowledge kind of firm. And so your next stop is Morgan Stanley. Tell us about that period of your career and just from a time framing standpoint, what were the years that that duty encompassed? So I looked and you and I are the exact same years of graduating high school and college. Neither one of us has to respect their elders incrementally. <laughs> so <laughs> let's see, I was Bernstein from 99 to 10, and then I left it to become the U.S. equity strategist and write quantitative research at Morgan Stanley. It's obviously a much bigger firm, number one business in the world in equities. I think I spoke at 44 conferences around the world during one year. So kind of more figurehead role, setting the outlook for the market, sitting on a seven-person asset allocation committee for a multi-trillion dollar private wealth network that had 17,000 advisors or whatever it was back then before the buddy trade. So kind of a different role, more macro, more quantitative. I had a portfolio that was a combination of quantitatively generated ideas with what the fundamental analysts like. So it's more of a weekly forum talking about whatever was happening globally, whether it was China or currency or rates or Bernstein didn't have an economist, forget strategists in every asset class in every region of the world and 44 economists or whatever the heck Morgan Stanley had. So it was a different breadth and size, but obviously also introduced you to more of a broad base of clients and certainly a wonderful experience in terms of meeting people and broadening my knowledge and stamping my passport. As you talk about the Bernstein days and this deep dive research process that's a long horizon, and then I think about you joining the firm in 1999, you're amidst this just epic bubble in valuations, which we knew the internet was going to be incredibly seismic in terms of the change it imparted on society, but we probably also knew in the back of our mind that the PE multiples were not sustainable at some point, a lot of these companies had to go away. Tell us just about the interaction between the, we do research for the long term, and we're experts in industry segments at Bernstein, versus a market that's just trading on such froth, on such enthusiasm, where price is the fundamental, as George Soros, I think, once said. What was that like during that period for you at Bernstein? Yeah, I mean, it's fair. I mean, I started there in 99, so I was I had the PhD a couple years of work experience, was still a little green on stocks. And to me, I knew it was a bubble and I knew the value funds, which at that time, Bernstein was more of a value-based asset manager on the buy side part of the firm, were not doing well. <laughs> and it wasn't cool to be working there. I felt that vibe a little bit just from the buy side. But to be honest, as you know, like each cycle, you learn something new and you add something else to your repertoire. And I guess you could always commiserate with people who are also positioned incorrectly. But if I think about the world now, and I think part of the reason you're asking the question, I'm extrapolating, there's probably some parallels. I think the froth and I think the EV to gross profit for the highest quintile stocks was almost as high 18 months ago as it was during the TMT bubble. So there's some parallels. I think it's a combination of everything. It's perception about rates. It's perception about growth. It's speculation. It's valuation. It's sentiment. It's positioning. It's always going to be a nine variable problem you're trying to isolate to one so your mind can understand it. You mentioned that point about the micro tweet or whatever. And at least once a week at Trivariate, we use the phrase, the Mark Twain phrase, you know, I didn't have time to write your short letter, so I wrote you a long one. And I think that so is true. I think the problem with the black books back in the day was, remember, with the same age, we were faxing research to people. And that sounds literally insane when you mention it now, but I think now you really do have to write the short letter. You have to take the time in. Every big firm, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, UBS, Credit Suisse, they are putting a container ship full of research in front of every buy side client every day. And they're saying, hey, you, Mr. Client, there's two gold coins in the container ship. 
you spend the time to rifle through it. If we don't do a good job of putting the coins in a shoebox or whatever the analogy would be, they're not going to read our stuff. And so I think you have to write the short letter and then have the confidence as you marinate in life that people trust that you put the work in behind that to make those statements. So I think I thought of it because you were talking about kind of the micro tweet versus black book. And I think neither one of them is good. I think the truth is in between, but probably closer to the micro tweet. Those words are from a longtime sell sider who realizes it's a crowded field. And there's definitely a lot to be said for finding a way to create, whether it's research or strategy, whatever you want to call it, it's thought process that's additive. And at some point, if it's additive and it's consistently additive, it's going to get through, but you got to find a way. You said something, Adam, that I wanted to just go back to, which is along the way in your career, you pick up these learning experiences as a result maybe of cycles. For me, they're giant risk-off events. That's what I learned from most as someone in the derivative space. And here we are, we're 25 years after the LTCM fiasco in 1998. And that was very formative for me, just in terms of the way in which vol can become so explosive and reflexive. As you think about the maybe period leading into the financial crisis, after the financial crisis, maybe it's the insanely low rate period we had with Fed policy post the GFC. What are some of those formative experiences for you that as you examine your process and your framework these days, you can kind of look back at and say, yeah, that was formative for me. There's a bunch of them. I mean, I guess when you're a chucklehead like me, you make enough mistakes where you (laughs) you have a lot of them. I mean, it's funny you pick the downturns because for me and my process, they're more, I think, that in the recovery phase, the junkier stocks rally. Right? I'm a U.S. equity focused predominantly. So I think it was hard sitting there in March of 09 or March 24th of 2020 to give a more recent memory and say, I should buy the crappiest, lowest quality, most indebted securities that are on the brink of filing for bankruptcy. And I should do that right now because those are the ones that go up the most. I think low quality securities are low quality because they have a lot of debt. And so their risk of bankruptcy is high. But the moment it looks like they're not going to go bankrupt anymore, they go up the most. For me, the processes are usually around when to take the risk on portion, when not to short those names for sure. I'll give you one macro thought and then a couple of micro ones just because I like this. There's so many learning lessons I have that I'm, it's hard to be cogent. But one is, in my personal account, I traded the yen several times. And every single time I've lost money. And I was short the thing into the Fukushima disaster and I lost money because the money flowed back in. I think sometimes understanding the catalyst is really important. And I think sometimes when you're at Bernstein and you're a long-term research guy, you don't think about the catalyst. For me, the catalyst for short anything was, wow, this makes no sense. There's so much debt they lend to each other, the rates, whatever. And then you kind of do that trade and then you lose money. And then finally, I just called my advisor. And I'm like, you're over-serving the drunk guy at the bar. Like, Stop <laughs> letting me trade. I don't know what I'm doing. I think focusing more on the catalysts in my career from the beginning is one. Two, I'd say at the stock level, I can give you a bunch of examples. I'm just trying to think out loud here. But I've heard this argument before, like, well, even if GE Capital is worth zero, GE is worth 100 after the financial crisis. Or even if Boeing 787 is worth zero, Boeing is worth 50. And the mistake there is zero is not a floor. GE Capital could be worth minus a billion or minus 10 billion. Sometimes we do that whole zero is a floor argument. And that's a learning lesson. Like zero is not a floor. It could be minus whatever. Like the whole thing could be worth negative. That's another one that I just remember sticking in my head. And then the third thing that popped in my head as you were asking that is more of like, I don't want to say it's like a rookie mistake at this point, but I think it happens every cycle where I've done this many times. I would bet you have, which is you confuse structural with cyclical at the wrong time. I can have a semiconductor industry that grows with an upward slope and it has a cycle, a sine wave that oscillates around the upward slope. But when it's above the, the trend line, I might think it's not cyclically over earning. I think a lot about cyclical versus structural. You might be the idiot who thinks there's no cycle when there still is. I think that this current regime is really an important one because the hangover of COVID is that you're underproducing consumption for a long time and then you end up overproducing. So you get a little bit twisted on what's cyclical and what's structural. I spent a lot of time thinking about that issue. Obviously, what goes into that change, not level, relative, not absolute, second derivative, not first derivative, all those nerdy stuff that people like you and I spent a lot of our last 20 years thinking about. But I'd say it's that cyclical structural debate that popped in my head when you asked that. 
when you look back on your years of being more focused on the bottom up and then maybe the last part of your career, starting with more of a top-down framework, but I'm sure incorporating a lot of bottoms up, I'd just love to learn a little bit more about the intersection there. Sometimes the top-down strategist really knows very little about the companies. And then the bottoms up strategist often is just so in the weeds on his or her sector or industry dynamics that they don't really see the bigger picture. You've done both. I'd love to just learn a little bit more about how you see those two aspects interacting with each other. Yeah. I mean, look, thanks for the ethos pitch. <laughs> Obviously, I try to make a career and have a business where I try to be fundamental for strategic or quant guys, like strategic or quantitative for the fundamental guys and live in that area in between. And so I try to flex that part of my background. I mean, trivariant stands for three variables. So they're supposed to be bottom, fundamental, quant, and macro applied to U.S. equities. And that's sort of our whole marketing spiel. And I try to sort of flex the fact that I have the PhD in statistics. So I have done a lot of analytical stuff, but I also was an analyst. I think for me, I'm proud of that analyst part that I alluded to because I feel like that really helps me think like, a client and most of our clients, more than 75% of our revenue comes from bottom up stock pickers. So that it's important for me, they understand, like, and I was on the buy side and worked at a bottom up stock picking fund. So it's important for me to resonate that our research ends with investable, actionable conclusions, long or short ideas or industry bets that embody the research. So for me, it's both. Our research really focuses on a few areas. We can talk about this later if you want, but I'd say once in a while we write about an industry in specific that we think really is a an investment controversy for an equity investor. And we wrote about semiconductors, my old sector, for the first time recently in a long time. And I did it because in many ways, I thought it was a microcosm for the market. Stocks were up a ton off lows last year because of momentum reversal, but estimates are probably 10, 20% too high because there's this thing as a soft landing for semiconductors. But the third leg is a lot of these grow above GDP in the long term and have big technological most low can't function without them. So we call this sort of the triple breaking putt. That was kind of our thesis. And there's like there's other parts of the market like that. You know, home builders have ripped, but probably did a lot of cancellations, but long term you need more structure. So we could create the analogs across multiple parts of the market that I know you know more about than I do. So I think when I do that work, sure, we're going to do quant work. What signals now we pick winners from losers? Is there available alpha? Are the stocks trading alike? Is company specific risk of low versus history? All that quanti stuff. Sure, we're going to do macro stuff in terms of where are we in the cycle, our revenues and margins and our and earnings and how far did they go down in prior downturns. But the fundamental part was we looked at the last two transcripts of the biggest 40 semiconductor companies and the giant word transcript diagnosis on channel inventory, backlog, book to bill. So it's bottom up. I don't do bottom up research in terms of setting price targets and building it in models for each company, but we're kind of digging in a little bit on the fundamentals too. So I just picked that because I thought it was sort of a relevant recent example of sort of combining the discipline to come up with hopefully a differentiated research note that helps investors in that part of the market. As you were describing some of the work on the semis, you definitely alluded to history and past cycles. And as I mentioned, you know, my own obsession is studying these episodes of crisis and Someone who's been on this podcast is former Fed Governor Kevin Warsh, who was in the Bernanke Firefighting Committee through 2008 and 2009. And a quote that he uses often, which I really like, is if you've seen one financial crisis, you've seen exactly one financial crisis. That there is just more uniqueness than anything else, than similarity. People might have different opinions on that. But when you In terms of your framework for assessing value, whether it's across sectors or at a moment in time, how much does history matter to you versus saying, look, this is a totally new world. Rates are much different than they were five years ago. Supply chains are different. How much can you rely on history in terms of when you get excited about an idea, how much of it leans on some valuation discrepancy versus history? Well, you took a right turn at the very end of that question. Because the valuation part is only just a minor part. As I was listening to you, I was saying the problem when you do quantitative research, what does that mean for equities? That means I'm building models to predict subsequent stock return. When I build the models, I'm training them on some data. The years that I used to train the data, let's say I used data from the 1990s to try to see which variables help me pick winners from losers in stocks. By definition, if I use the 90s, valuation was effective, then if valuation is effective in the 
quote unquote live regime, then the model's going to work well. If valuation fails like it did for much of the last five years before COVID, then the model's going to do poorly. So your question is totally spot on, as you know, which is when you build a model data wise, analytical, systematic, no emotion, when you actually build a model to predict returns, like stock returns, the period of time you use to train the model is going to create some biases that if the future is different than the past, those biases, those signals are not going to be effective. So I think you're totally spot on. I think you always have to ask yourself, is this regime relevant? For example, the signals work the same when rates are falling as they did when they're rising, because we don't have a lot of, we have kind of a 30-year saw saw shape kind of trend on bonds. There's not a lot of sustained periods where they rose. So how do you know which signals are going to be effective when they rise and the like? So I think it's one of the biggest quant debates ever, which is what is a relevant time frame to use to build predictive models? And I think there's my view, which maybe is self-serving, is a combination of judgment set and logic fundamentals and kind of quant are the best way to hoe the row. Well, let's just talk a little bit about the current setup in terms of pricing. And maybe you can frame it in the language that most suits you. Some people might say, what sectors do you like? Are there factor exposures that are glaringly out of line or some things that you think are going to be effective or are hard passes and you want to avoid? What does this the world look like? And maybe we'll just stay with U.S. equities here, but just big picture in terms of the calls that Trivariate is making right now. Inform us just about the current work and where you guys see value. If you indulge me to back up a little bit about what we do, because I think it will help frame your question. So Trivariate has sort of three verticals. Our customers are people who manage equity, so long only hedge funds, family offices, even private equity firms, allocators. Then we have a bunch of RIA, registered investment advisor, financial advisor networks. And our third is corporates. We do a lot of work directly for the CEO, the CFO, IR, treasury of public companies where they want some bespoke analysis, advisory, or research. So it kind of depends on who I'm talking to um, with exactly the work we do. But when I was on the buy side and I told you I was getting those container shifts of stuff from all the big firms and I just couldn't process it all, when I decided to come back and form Trivariate, we said we have to go where we think there isn't a lot of good work on the equity market. One is risk management. Two is position sizing. Three is industry frameworks where we put the context, like you're saying, trivariate context, macro quant fundamental. Four is frameworks for investing. What I've realized in, in terms of trying to monetize my efforts, I guess, is that basically market commentary is free from every bull racket firm. Like if you go to my trivariate website and you search on the word PAL, it's going to say zero search results. And I'm kind of proud of that because my view is people get that commentary from everywhere else, and I'm not going to be additive to it. I worked with a guy who wrote papers with Bernanke. He was the economist at Morgan Stanley, and I didn't think it was particularly fruitful in helping him make short-term Fed calls. If he can't do it, how the heck am I going to do it? That's not my jam. So I'd rather focus on what I'm good at. I think we've signed 34 non-disclosure agreements in the less than two years they've been in business with buy-side firms who send us their portfolio to do custom risk work, almost like outsourced chief risk officer work. We do a lot of advisory work where we're taking this database we've built and all the work we do is coded in Python and computed on the cloud. We're not guys in fleeces with Excel spreadsheets anymore. That's kind of an anachronism for the quant research. So I think it's kind of evolved a little bit. We want to flex the fact that we spend a lot of money on data and we can do things that are difficult for people to replicate. So I only do that preamble because that affects generally most of the work we do in those areas. Now, in terms of the tenor of your question, certainly I do talk strategy, market strategy, the way I'm looking at the world is the backdrop that I'm looking at is erode, not implode, that you had very high nominal GDP. Things are eroding, not imploding. There's reasons they're not imploding, which are artifacts of COVID. You'll probably have higher auto sales this year, 83 versus 80 million, even though the economy is slowing. You'll have the amplitude and period to see certain cycles in the industrial sector got altered by COVID, whether it's aerospace, defense, agriculture, oil and gas. I mean, we go through the list. So in an erode, not implode backdrop, what we've been telling people, Dean, is you either have to own cheap cyclicals that have low earnings expectations, don't have inventory problems, they can repair their balance sheets in the interim, energy, metals, could select consumer finance, et cetera, or stuff that can kind of grow through so that the ultimate 2024 P&L, revenues, cash flows, and earnings, net income dollars, will look better than, say, 2022, even in the eroding backdrop. And so kind of that barbell 
strategy is how we've been sort of positioning people and trying to avoid the stuff that's in between the no we rules. We call it marriage material, like the stocks that are fine, they trade 25 times earnings. That's hard because equity investing, and I know you do everything, but like to me, equity investing is I buy my little dream today, I sell it to a sucker with a bigger dream later. It's hard to have a bigger dream later if you can't see earnings exploding up or you can't see the multiple expanding a ton. And I think no matter how you view the world now, in absolute terms, it looks worse than it did three months ago. And so for me, why do I say that? Well, 2020 for earnings came out. They're for 11.5% earnings growth. They're way too high. Interest rates, why would anybody buy Pepsi at 26 times forward if they had the flexibility to buy a one-year or a two-year or a six-month bond or whatever? So the relative asset class looks less compelling because of rates. The Fed's hawkish. We know that. And what affects equity market multiples is perception about rates, the Fed fund futures. So the perception about growth is too optimistic. The perception about rates is more hawkish. Valuation went from below 15 times 2023 on October 1st last year to 18 now. So things aren't as cheap. Speculation feels more rampant to me, no matter how you compute that. Bitcoin, Goldman Profitless Software Basket, Tesla, whatever. Pick your proxy. So the only thing that's hard to gauge, and like any bull argument people were making in the 22 meetings of the last week where I asked people this, was always about positioning. Like, yeah, you know, the Fed gets out of the way and people aren't positioned for it. And it's like, all right, so I'm, I'm playing for the last couple of innings of the rally or the extra innings as opposed to – so my view is things look worse than they did three months ago, no matter how you slice it on the major sort of consideration. It's amazing just the degree to which rates and the dollar – have become such driving factors in risk asset outcomes. If I did an intraday today of the S&P versus the VIX and the S&P versus the DXY, you'd actually be convinced that the S&P was more correlated to the dollar than it is to the VIX, more negatively correlated. So it's an incredibly interesting environment. And I think you just talk about the way in which speculation has crept back into the market. It's going to be really a process for the market to, I think, absorb some of these more recent turns of expected Fed hikes. How much of just looking at the short rate and maybe thinking that that just becomes a competing asset, if you can earn 5% doing nothing, the hurdle rate becomes higher. How does that feed into some of the models and valuation framework? In your question, I'd say there's a couple of things. One, if our work has shown for 18 months plus now that there's a statistically significant relationship between the perception about rates, we use FF24, so Fed Fund Futures 24 months from now, but you could use 12 or 36 or whatever. But as the perception about rates changes, it impacts multiples. Our work shows for every 100 fifths they get incrementally hawkish. That would be about one and a half turns of multiple contraction for the market, three and change turns of contraction for growth stocks. So there's no question that a hawkish Powell commentary makes the market sell off on a day like today because and makes the dollar change too, it's all the same thing. It's a commentary about the relative monetary policy of the U.S. versus the euro or whatever. Um, embarrassingly, the choir explained to the preacher <laughs> the concept right now, because I know you know more about this than I do, but the stuff we study impacts multiples. That's for sure the case. And we look at that a lot. I think back to when I was a semiconductor analyst, I honestly didn't even know what the 10-year yield was. I didn't know if it was four, three, five, I mean, you could even debate if I even knew what the concept was. That's not what I meant. But I mean, like the level, but I didn't care. Like I covered Intel and AMD and I wanted to know if gross margins were too high or lower in the consensus six months from now. And that's where I spent all my time, CapEx, depreciation, mix, pricing, like all that stuff. And I didn't really care. Now there isn't a single software or semiconductor analyst in the world that wasn't telling me what the owner's equivalent rent portion of the CPI is. Of the 24 industries in the market, 11 sectors, 24 industry groups, the 23rd most company specific last year was software and the 24th was semis. So all these, quote, unquote, cold-blooded stock picking tech analysts now realize that they have the two most macro sectors in the market. And it's all about the Fed. It's all about perception about rates and et cetera, et cetera. It matters a lot to the process, for sure. It's certainly in any six or nine month deal. I know in some of your work, some of the customized work, you'll create baskets, theme type baskets. And one of them that certainly became a thing probably in the maybe 2021 period was this work from home versus back to work, this divergence. And there were a bunch that fit into one basket and a bunch that fit into another. And they really just interacted with interest rates specifically in very opposite ways. As we're having this conversation, we're literally three years post what really became the market 
crisis due to the pandemic. There was a health crisis, but the market for the three weeks in March. March 23 was the low. You're right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In a lot of ways, it imposed itself on relationships in asset prices in a way that we'd never seen before. This is where I wanted to get some of your thoughts, just as someone who harnesses data, collects data. There were some funky relationships that emerged. Again, the performance of the work from home basket versus the back to work basket, the valuation discrepancies between cheap stocks and expensive stocks were at all time highs. What's the evolution of that kind of stuff? Are there glaring disconnects now or are things more middle of the road? I'd love just to you walk us through the last couple of years. Good question. And it's a good example because I know when you do risk work, like both of us do, my general view is if risk didn't change, anyone could do risk management. So I was running a Triberic Capital. We had a hedge fund before we converted to a research firm in 2021. And I guess as a former Morgan Stanley employee, when I was writing my Q3 2020 letter to my investors, I had a former MS guy, I had a little pride. And I remember writing in my letter, wow, Zoom is worth more than Morgan Stanley market cap wise. And as I was writing that, I checked and there was a moment, I can't remember if it was August of 20 or not in that time frame, where Zoom was worth more than Morgan Stanley plus Goldman Sachs combined. And so you had this moment of these two companies, which are fabulous money making machines that had something like 16 or 18 billion in forecasted operating profit versus this thing that had 600 million and no obvious technological moat. When we wrote that letter to our investors in the fund, we started tracking and came up with what we call the reopening and a work from home, and then also a quality and junk reopening and a quality and junk work from home. So sort of four different baskets. And the thought process emerged. In the beginning, we thought we don't want to be too short reopening because you could sit there and say, all right, these companies think because you know, everyone's working from home. But when the Pfizer vaccine announcement came out on November 9th, 2020, if you were short, I'll name something you probably never heard of. There's a company called EPR. It's an entertainment REIT that happened to have AMC feeders on its property. Well, what do you think happened the day of the Pfizer vaccine announcement? It went from 10 to 15 in three seconds. So you're short some minutes of 50%. If you weren't mindful of your risk management on reopening, you got run over. Then I think as you went to 2021, things started changing. And when my observation to clients was like, there's a big disconnect where quality reopening still hasn't beaten junk work from home. And so we talk about the junk work from home shorts. And that kind of played out with Peloton and Zoom and Sam Adams, which was the truly that everyone was drinking during COVID, you know, alcoholic seltzers or whatever they call them. You saw those work from home stocks start to really unwind. And I think it was a function of not just reopening work from home, but it shifted to kind of high versus low quality reopening versus work from home. So I think you have to monitor those things in the portfolio. When we do our bespoke analysis for people, we talk about are they offsides on their long versus their short side if they happen to be a hedge fund on reopening, quality reopening, junk reopening, exposure on both sides of the book. Generally, you want to be careful of being too short junk stocks when the economy is improving. But once it starts decelerating, then you can kind of amp that up again. So for me, it was a long story about observing on the insane valuations for some of these work from home stocks. You know, what's probably the most perverse example of that, Dean, is the barbecue grill space. So I don't know if you follow this, but or if you probably are a user of some of these products, but there's a company called Traeger, the ticker COOK, and another one, Weber, W-E-B, where they both IPO'd in 2021. One's now private. The other one's down 90% from the IPO price because basically it's like the most pull forward of demand perverse example from COVID. Everyone was like, wow, I can't go to restaurants. I got to be in my yard. I'm going to like up my grill game. So everyone bought a Traeger and a Weber, but it turns out you don't need one every year. So there's a huge pull forward of demand. Of course, the stocks IPO'd in July and August of 21. And then basically those companies got on their conference calls after they went public and said, yeah, Walmart and Home Depot told us they don't need one for a year. So it was like the most perverse pull forward of demand. So I think a lot of what you're trying to do there is see how much revenue growth these businesses have had recently versus their long-term averages. What's the inventory look like so that you can kind of gauge, has there been a pull forward in demand? Like what's the magnitude of the pull forward in demand? Ultimately, I think stock peers care about relative estimate achievability and whether the estimates are more or less achievable six months hence. And so that's, I think, what a lot of the research should be focused on is relative estimate achievability when you're trying to beat the market in the portfolio. 
My son Aiden did get me a Traeger smoker for Father's Day in 2022, I think, and it's been amazing. But the way you describe the pull forward and the way in which the pandemic just wrecked havoc on so many relationships and introduced some new ones. And maybe just talking a little bit about the value factor. The value factor had never been as cheap as it was. I guess I'm going to say circa late 2021. I can't exactly remember, but even tried and true diehards like Cliff Asnes were saying, look, you can't time factors. There's the time variation in them is really difficult to call and predict, but there's value and value. That's what systematic investing is about. It's finding these factors that work consistently, but timing them's hard. And even he was pushed to say, well, maybe it does make sense to overweight value a little bit. That's how cheap it had gotten. I just would love just to have you reflect a little bit on how dislocated some of these relationships got. And then if you're just staring at them, looking at them, and price becomes the fundamental. People want to get long Zoom because it's going up. They don't really care about the fundamentals anymore. It's a party. <laughs> What's that like? Look, I spent a lot of my career looking at signal efficacy. I guess I'll try to keep the quant jargon. I'll pump the brakes on excessive quant jargon. But I'd say, like, if you have a strategy, which is you buy stocks that are cheap on price of cash flow and short those that are expensive, or you buy stocks that are cheap on price support or any sort of EV to forecast itself or whatever your signal is, you can then observe the subsequent performance of that strategy. So over like a 30 or 40 year view, you probably generated eight to 9% per annum return value just longing stocks that are cheap on price of cash flow and shorting those that are expensive, right? And I assume a chunk of AQR success was associated with things like that in the early days. It's a tried and trusted strategy. In terms of factor timing or that comment you made there, I think our work has shown in the past that 100% of a factor's efficacy is accrued at 30% of the month. So the problem is, if you time it, you better not miss one of the 30% of months, the three, four months a year where it really works. So I think that's one of the reasons it's challenging and maybe hard to do. So that's my first thought. My second thought is that our work has shown pretty convincingly that valuation doesn't work for the extreme 20% of companies, the really fast growing ones or the really cheap ones. So if I parse the market and say the bottom decile on price forward earnings, and I'm making a number of, let's say, 10% of the companies trade below eight times forward. It turns out in that cohort, it's not affected the long the ones that traded five times and short the ones that traded eight times. Like valuation is not a good signal for super cheap stocks because they're super cheap for a reason. They're autos, they're airlines, there's technological obsolescence risk, there's some, they make plastic, whatever. I think, and same thing with really fast growing stocks. If you're really fast growing and cheap, the market's already figured out there's some sort of technological obsolescence risk or some cyclicality or some competitor product that can impact the, the dynamics. So I kind of feel like, What's changed in the last 10 or 15 years is you really can't use valuation for, let's say, the extreme 10, 15% of stocks on each side. You got to keep it more in the fairway, I guess. So my thinking's kind of evolved on that. And I don't really use, like, for example, I'll really get nerdy for a second. We take the top 3,000 US equities and we break them into 21 different buckets. And we have different models to predict return on those 21 buckets. Right now, only nine of them even have valuation in there. So that's a bit of a barometer for like, how much of the market I think valuation sustainably is affected in. Of course, it ultimately matters what you're paying, especially at the extremes. But what you're saying is the work that you're doing is focused on predicting profit. And that exercise is pretty different across different kinds of companies. We try to predict stock price. That's it. I'll give you an example. I don't want to ramble, but like stocks that had the most multiple contraction, I looked at the last 10 market downturns at 10% or more, and I said, how do the stocks that have the most multiple contraction prior to the market behave during the subsequent correction? You know which stocks were the worst? The ones that had the most contraction prior, not the ones with the most expansion prior. So you think to yourself, well, stocks that went up a lot, if the market's about to go down, they're going to get killed because they're relatively expensive. No. The stocks that had the most multiple contraction go down the most because the market on average is white and predictive and anticipatory to have taken the, the multiples down. You know what I mean? Like the market's right that the ones that they got cheap, they got cheap for a reason. They stink. They're exposed. There's volatility in their underlying p &L. So let's speak English. Think about this earnings season. There's consumer stocks that trade seven times earnings, and then they miss. They go down 25%. The valuation doesn't always protect. It's not always like, oh, it's in the price. I think that's maybe involved. The market gets more anticipatory. Like when I started covering Intel, Dean, it's so funny. I remember when they raised capital spending. I remember CNBC being like, oh, this is bullish. Demand must be good. They have to add capacity. 
stock goes up when they announce higher capital spending. This is 20 years ago. Then everyone sees what happens. Oh, when you add capacity, you put all this fixed cost of price, your depreciation is a huge burden on your cogs, the economy slows, you're overproducing like crazy, your margins get creamed. So then the next cycle, when Intel raises CapEx, the stock goes down immediately when they announce it. Like the exact opposite of what happened because people have seen the movie and they're like, that movie stinks. So it's not always declining valuation isn't always a positive. Think about dividend yield. Another good example. Is dividend yield of 8%? Does that mean, oh, wow, that's a lot of good yield? No, on average, the reason yields rise in some cases is because the price went down. The price went down because the market, quote unquote, knows they're about to cut their dividend. I'm not saying, hey, it's all perverse, but I'm saying that's what complicates things over time as investors get increasingly anticipatory. As you were talking about the challenges in market timing and factor timing and maybe being out of the market and having an opportunity cost of not getting that return when you're out. The flip side is also interesting to talk about, and this is where I want to take the conversation, which is on your work on the risk management side. And crowding specifically is a fascinating area of investigation. I like to say it's elusive. It's really difficult to know exactly how crowded something is. In my own space of equity derivatives, the amount of analysis that's done on the option positioning and the mechanical hedging that results from it, it's a little exhausting and it's just not exact enough to draw the kinds of conclusions that people suggest (laughs) are able to be drawn. It's always the market did it, but positioning is really important and crowding specifically can be a source of risk. You don't want to be in a situation where you're along something with weak hands. That creates a vulnerability. So Tell us about your framework when you think about crowding, what exactly do you mean and some of the work that you've done on that front? No, sure. We have a crowding score. We actually sell to a lot of clients. I guess everyone sitting in my shoes would say, hey, man, we're special and ours is like differentiated and awesome. The second most overused sell side word is proprietary. (laughs) What's the first? The most channel check. (laughs) (laughs) I remember when I was at a semiconductor, I was like, oh, I did a channel check. I'm like, what does that mean? What do you mean? We can debrief your listeners on the fraudulent phrase warnings from the sell side. But anyway, what's our proprietary framework for crowding? Look, one of the great things about working with Morgan Stanley than many is I got access to like really great hedge fund managers, bottom of stock pickers. So we have a list of, it's about 60 bottom of stock pickers. They have to own more than 10 stocks, less than 100. So I get rid of the quants. They have to run between one and 10 billion. So I'm getting rid of massive funds and tiny ones. And then I look for... I know all the CEOs, so I know what their investment you know, philosophy is, their bottom-up stock pickers. And then I can download from the 13F filings if they have high conviction, which, you know, we did a lot of research and now define as 3% or more of their long AUM. So the idea is these are bottom-up stock pickers who own enough of a stock that they probably didn't work and they're waiting to something to pan over the next few quarters fundamentally. What I was trying to do, Dean, was systematically get at good bottom-up stock pickers, high conviction ideas. I don't know if they're short against it. I don't know if they're doing derivatives against it. I don't know if they're on swap. I have to take a big enough position and know that these guys probably did work to get that big. So that was my logic stream. And then I compare my 60 guys, high conviction, pro rata to another 550 managers out there. And I compare the subsequent performance, volatility, adjusted performance, et cetera. And I learned a few things. If none of my 60 have high conviction in a name, but lots of the other 550 managers do, that's bad crowding. The way you phrase it is spot on in my judgment, which is I went into the project thinking there's probably not alpha in these names, but there might just be more risk without commensurate alpha. So, you know, I want to buy a stock when it has a, if it's not crowded at all, I'm going to sell it when it's maximally crowded, but my ability to time the entry and exit might destroy the alpha. So when I went into it, I wasn't sure there'd be any alpha, but it turns out that if none of my 60, all these 60 smart guys, if not a single one of the CIOs thinks that it's worth owning an eye conviction, it's probably not because it's some under-investigated issue. It's probably because it stinks, especially if it's crowded by these other 500 funds that aren't my guys. So we actually found negative alpha in a cohort by comparing this proprietary group of managers and their high conviction ideas. So we have a combined credit score that's a function of my 60 high conviction change and level change in the level of volatility, change in the level of liquidity. So it's a six-factor model kind of compared to the industry group average of stocks in, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a little, gets a little nerdy after that. But the secret sauce is really in my universe and their high conviction. And then just in terms of characterizing areas of crowding or the degree of crowdedness in pockets of the market now versus 
at other points in time. How do things look? Are there things that really stand out that are cause for concern? Or is it more of a middle of the road type of environment? Everything seems inflated, no? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just pausing, having a pensive moment. What's that called on stage when you're a soliloquy or like, I don't know. At the end of the day, I think on um, the places that are the least crowded are generally the areas where bottom up stock pickers don't really go. So, energy utilities, REITs, metals, insurance. I'm giving you an equity centric answer. I think the more crowded names, and we actually, you'll love this. We did a big research note in December 2022 called Analyzing the Sell Side Recommendations to the Opposite. So we looked at the stocks that have the most buy ratings and have like the biggest increases in price carry changes. And we showed that if you just did the opposite of the sell side, you did better. So particularly attacking consumer discretionary software, et cetera. So I think there's a lot of evidence that those are the areas that get a little bit more frothy. I don't want to own a stock that's got 37 buys, one hold and one sell. That's no good. And when we talk to our corporate clients that I mentioned to you, sometimes the investor relations guys, you'd be surprised, man. They get like all excited when an analyst upgrades the stock and they like present to the board the quotes the person used. And I'm always saying like, guys, this is a disaster. The last thing you want is 16 buys, no holds, no sells. That means that your stock already went up a ton and now the estimates are too optimistic. Just explain the facts and correct the mistakes that the chuckleheads make in the research notes. There's so many drivers to prices. We talked a little bit about rates. You referenced that it was almost a 40 odd year tailwind of low rates with obviously some bear market periods along the way, but you could roughly say from 1981 to 2021, there was about 40 years where on average rates were coming down rather than going up. That's a thing that makes matters for valuations. There's sentiment and all the narratives that go out there. There's forces in markets like Reddit that rear their heads and have a giant impact on prices. There's folks doing deep dive work on a valuation front. And then, of course, there's just flows. Money is either coming into the market, coming out of the market. As you kind of look at where we've come from, we had our, our lows probably around, I want to say late September, early October. We've rallied a fair amount since then. What do you attribute that to? Is that the market getting more comfortable with the Fed cycle? Is it something different? How do you explain the last couple of months in terms of the rally? I think it's so funny on a like today. You wonder if it's over, but I get the tenor of your question, man. I mean, I think I could tell you a story after the fact, which is ubiquitous sentiment in December on the year ahead outlook was the market's going to go down in the first half of the year, up in the second half of the year. You can't own anything that loses money. So naturally, the market went up, and then you can own stuff that lost money. I think the biggest bull argument was weak positioning, poor sentiment, and a consensus view to do the opposite of it. I could give you a fundamental story, which is, the economy's still in pretty good shape. The consumer looks like it's okay. And so if investing is some Monte Carlo where I have a different set of outcomes, probability each one, and what that does for earnings and multiples, maybe the tail risk, the really bear case, the employed in earnings, has a lower probability now than it did two, three months ago. And that kind of justified a little bit of multiple expansion. And that's not like a crazy argument ex post, but I don't think it was like the reason to rally. I think it was positioning. I think it was, look, so much money is running platforms now. When you and I started, there was no such thing as some guy with 20 longs and 20 shorts running market neutral with a whole job of getting a half an alpha dial a quarter. He or she gets a half an alpha dial a quarter. I'm going to run 600, 1200 in the back room, and that's 12%, 24% per year. And if I control the risk, like I'm a god. So all of a sudden, you think I'm running a $40 billion balance sheet, but really it's like $200 billion or $400 billion or whatever it is. The flows argument, which in our day was, ooh, the retail flows, mutual fund cash, that's irrelevant. The question is, how much can the platforms borrow from Morgan Stanley, Goldman, and JP Morgan? And if they're the biggest payers, there's no chance those guys are going to say no. All they pay for is access to borrow, access to risk, anonymity, all that stuff. You're not going to say, hey, you're my client that plays $200 million, but I'm not going to let you take the balance sheet up because you see an opportunity to pick long short better for the next two months. And that dwarfs some account that pays a million bucks or whatever. I think the flows argument, the sentiment argument can be kind of more powerful and more volatile. And we see that in our work. I mean, last July, I wrote a note about signal volatility and signal correlation. It was the highest it had been in 40 years. So I buy stocks that are cheap on price of cash flow and short those are expensive. I lost or made 3% or more in one day, more days in 2022 than all the years before that combined. So that's signal volatility. And that's from the platforms. And that's just the way 
kind of money being run. I, I forget what the data is, but I think the biggest three firms reported that 30% of their revenue comes from two to five day holding period. In my world, it's the zero day to expiration option. And there is some truncation of feedback that looks like market participants expect. They expect things to materialize over a shorter horizon. I wanted to ask you this as well, just as we kind of round out the conversation, but just to try to get a little further into some of your work on crowding. And I want to ask the question a little bit differently, which is crowding, the goal there is to try to inform yourself on size. If something is potentially crowded, it might mean there could be unwanted vol on an unwind, and it might mean that I should be probably smaller than otherwise if it was less crowded. Another really important aspect of sizing is correlation. So if I'm constructing my portfolio, I'm trying to find stuff that adds value to the portfolio, but the correlation structure across the elements in the portfolio is critical as well. And so some part of our conversation has talked about rates, the short rate, and a lot of the factor work seems like it started to really hinge on how was the portfolio exposure linked to inflation? How was it linked to rates? And different exposures feel like they're on one side or the other of that factor. So my question is just in terms of looking forward, Adam, on the portfolio construction side, how do you find ways to recommend trades that should do well, but also are not the same thing to avoid falling into some trap where, oh my God, my entire portfolio was a factor that was led to a very correlated result, which I was trying to avoid. Well, I guess I'm romanticizing that when I build these quantitative miles for return, we're taking some signals from balance sheet, income statement, cash flow, accounting, sentiment, valuation, ownership, whatever, so that I'm not having too much of the weight in the ultimate forecast come from one of those disciplines so that if valuation fails, something else is likely to work. And so on average, over time, for large baskets of stocks, it'll add value. You mentioned something before when you mentioned Cliff Asmus and factor timing that I want to come back to because you just kind of made me think of it again here. One of the things we do at Trivariant is we suggest about 150 macro variables, and we use those to compute sine waves where we kind of say, where are we on consumer activity? Where are we on financial conditions? Where are we on industrial activity? Where are we on economic activity? And it's just to gauge where we are. But then what I do is I say, well, maybe some of my quantitative models work better consistently in certain areas, economic setups, and work more poorly in others. So for example, let's say my ability to pick winners from losers in consumer discretionary is really bad when the economy's low but accelerating, but really good when it's high and decelerating. If I know that that's where I am now, I can kind of increase my gross exposure to that area. And my models are likely to work better. So that's a way of sort of factor timing the balance of the factors that I'm using. Another thing that I think is important, so we use that. Basically, we rank the stocks one to 3,000, but then we kind of re-rank them based on the regime we're in to say, all right, well, maybe the discretionary ones, that model's going to work well, and I should put an amplifier on there and move more to the extreme so I can capture more performance from the models that are likely to work well. So the, the second thing that you made me think of, and we've been writing about this as a risk, I want to give you an example of that common and made if risk didn't change anyone could do risk management. We got into a little bit with reopening work from home quality junk, but another example, which I think matters, that basically no fundamental stock figures ever think about is signal correlation. So let's say I'm a young analyst and I walk in your office at a fund and I say, hey, Dean, man, I want to buy XYZ because their margins are expanding and their revenue is growing faster than their peers and the cheaper price of cash flow and they're buying back stock and I'm ripping off reasons. What I never say to you is how correlated those reasons are. So we've noticed in a couple parts of the market, healthcare, industrials, et cetera, that when I built the model, I trained it on data, say, from 2011, 2019. I had eight signals in the model. Again, price of cash flow, whatever they are. When I built the model, I think I'm a decent statistician. Maybe the average pairwise correlation of those signals, the efficacy of those signals is 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So I'm capturing different things. So if valuation fails, I don't, the model still works. Now, those same signals that were 0 0.1, 0 0.2 correlated for a decade are now 0 0.7. Now, I'm going in there thinking I'm giving you different reasons to own the stock, but the reality is they're all the same. There's some sort of China reopening, build back better, whatever. So healthcare was a function of a vaccine or whatever. So like, I think it's important to track risk through signal correlation and deviations in signal correlation. We had a client ask us about healthcare the other day. Hey, why are the signals so correlated? The last time they got correlated, what kind of stocks worked and what kind of signals helped me pick winners from losers. So that's an area where we dive in and help them 
it's an important and emerging risk. Because if I'm sitting there still picking industrial stocks with the same factors and variables I used from 11 to 19, when they used to be kind of diversifying and now they're totally correlated, I'm going to fail. Guys like you know how hard this is to get it right. Even a little north of 50% of the time is going to be a win and comes down to a discernible process that you can execute over time, but also you want to fine tune it. And I'm just curious as we close the conversation about the kind of things you're working on, just with regard to whether it's future ways of analyzing data, things that you and the team are studying to fine tune your framework and approach. What's the market maybe in the process of teaching you about your framework that you're working to augment? Two areas I'm working on right now. I mean, the answer question is 100%. I mean, you're 100% right, which is we're always adding new things. I think if you're dogmatic about something, then you're really just regime specific. So I'm always learning, trying to add new things to the process. And one thing I think I kind of alluded to when I mentioned semiconductors earlier, which is I think we're going to use language processing and kind of machine learning to go through more transcripts. You can kind of refine the way you do it, looking for channel inventory backlog, book to bill, backlog cancellation, distribution. Because when you're really, the problem with semiconductors is the inventory on their balance sheet is almost meaningless in terms of whether they're actually overproducing or underproducing consumption at any given moment. Because if I ship it to the distributor and the distributor is sitting on it, it's not on my balance sheet, it's on theirs it's still going to impede my forward revenue and margins if that has to get burned off before I get new orders. There's a complicated text dictionary sort of language processing that I think we can get better at. I think we can do it in Chinese as well. And that might be useful for the number of the companies that are over there. So there's a way I want to get at that issue because I think those are going to be important issues for industrials and cyclicals and semiconductors. The second area I'm super interested in is the variable compensation of the C-suite. So if I'm a CFO or a CEO and I get paid on per share based metrics, you know, earnings per share about 10%, I give you another six million in, in stock or whatever it is. I think that's really, I don't want to sound crusty, but I'd say very few people purposely destroy their own net worth. If I get variably compensated for per share based metrics, I'm going to like the buyback. If I get the dividend on the unvested portion of my deferred comp, I'm going to like the dividend. But companies don't report systematically how the C suite is variably compensated. And I think we can use some language processing and transcript and K and Q reading technologies to get some pretty cool stuff out of those two areas. And then one last nugget I'll give you is I'm really focused on incremental gross margins. So what are the gross margins on the revenue above today's level? What's embedded in the estimates for incremental gross margin? The estimates above or below a business's long-term average, because I think ultimately this whole thing is about relative estimate achievability, as I mentioned earlier, and that's going to come down to assumptions about margins and whether they're achievable or not. So I think those are hot on our first half 2023 and to our other arrows in our quiver. Well, there is certainly some academic research on the incentivization structures and how corporate CEOs respond, whether it's stock-based comp or option-based comps and sometimes linking that to the vol attributes of the company because the CEO may behave differently. So that's a really interesting area to go down. Well, Adam, we covered a lot of ground here today. I'm really excited we got a chance to have this discussion and learn more about not only your background, but about the really interesting work you and your team are doing at Trivariate. So congrats on starting it, and it was great to connect with you. Thanks a lot. Great to spend time with you. You've been listening to The Alpha Exchange. If you've enjoyed the show, please do tell a friend. And before we leave, I wanted to invite you to drop us some feedback. As we aim to utilize these conversations to contribute to the investment community's understanding of risk, your input is valuable and provides direction on where we should focus. Please email us at feedback at alphaexchangepodcast.com. Thanks again and catch you next time. 